Food palatability is how a food tastes in relation to its nutrient content and preparation. This can ultimately tell us what foods we should be eating, figuring out what diets we should be following. If you guys have been asking questions about Frank, can I eat white rice? What carbs can I eat? Is it okay to eat certain vegetables, certain things? This should answer those questions. And uh, as we can see by the happy face here, uh, you have various tongue receptors, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, acidic, umami, and riches. And, and these might not all be flavoral sensations of the tongue, but what all of these things do is they contribute to the flavor of a food, and that's what makes it taste good. And each of these things relate to a macronutrient or a actual micronutrient in the food. So in the case of sweet, we're looking at sugar or carbohydrates for energy. In the case of salty, it relates to iodine and ocean foods. In the case of sour, bitter, and acidic, we're typically looking at either fermented foods uh, that can be very acidic and sour, or we're looking at like bitter root herbs and things that are used in teas. In the case of umami, we're looking at fermented food and there are various nutritional benefits to fermenting food, such as a higher K2 content in cheese to a higher K2 content in a food like natto. Uh, the richness, the fat and cholesterol is correlated directly to the fat content of the food and the nutrient content as well in regards to omega-3s like DHA and that ties in with energy as well. Now foods have various degrees of this, but we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So the base palatability of a food is in its least processed edible state. So whatever it takes you to consume that food, in the case of meat, meat could be consumed raw. In the case of something like broccoli, it would be steamed. So that is the base palatability of a food in its least processed edible state. Now, whether you cook a food or consume it raw, that does not necessarily justify that a food is not natural and that we shouldn't be eating it. When you start seasoning it, marinating it, refining and artificial flavors, this is where if a food is not edible or consumable in its most natural edible state, you have to do things to it like vegans do with adding 10 different seasonings on their chickpeas and lentils, that is unnatural palatability. Uh, you know, a good example of a base palatable food, uh, increasing it to a very hyper palatable food is you take, you can maybe eat two pounds of raw meat, then you can eat three pounds if it's cooked, that's still not a big deal. You add salt to it, three and a half pounds. Uh, you season it with salt and pepper, maybe you eat four pounds now. And then if you add like aged balsamic vinegar on it, a little sweetness, now you can eat four and a half pounds. So it's interesting how by increasing the palatability and cooking the food with seasoning, you can increase the consumption of almost twofold. And I think that's pretty evident in what a lot of people do now on the zero carb carnivore diet with things like burgers and bacon. Sometimes hyper palatable foods create unrealistic hunger signals. I mean, maybe you are someone that consume an equal amount of cooked and raw meat, but that is unlikely in the case of like potato chips, uh, desserts, bacon, and all of these have one thing in common that they have multiple flavoral components that are unnatural that are combined. In the case of potato chips, they are fried, they have fat, they have salt, they have a crunchy texture. It's, there's not really anything in nature that would replicate that uh, besides maybe like a crispy piece of fat off of an animal, but maybe that wouldn't be salty. Uh, sugar or fat in dessert, when we combine sweet and fat, that's where we get you know, the obesity epidemic, a lot of hyper palatable foods that are very calorically dense. And I mean, something like bacon is an example of salt, sugar in the curing process, and also smoke for flavor. So uh, that flavoral element, that aromatic element that you add to a food can also contribute to it. Uh, that's why if we look at ice cream, where ice cream has egg yolks, it has more richness, it has sugar, it has sweetness, it has that base dairy flavor. There's multiple components to ice cream that make it taste good. Vanilla, chocolate, you're not only adding sweet, and fat and richness to ice cream to give it an unrealistic palatability. You're also adding aromatic qualities like vanilla. And the reason those aromatic qualities are important to note is because they would have been present in natural foods. Like if the cow was on a very high quality pasture, it would have a nutty taste to it. So can these foods be healthy though? I mean, if you have pasture raised bacon, uh, ice cream made with quality ingredients, I have a video making ice cream with pastured eggs, raw cream, raw honey it can be healthy. I mean, it still might be hyper palatable and you might put on a little bit more weight than the other foods, but the difference between those foods and a healthy version is 
they are literally not inflammatory. You know, the bacon's going to have high omega six. It's going to be processed. It's going to be old. The pasture bacon is going to have a better omega three to omega six ratio. It's going to have a higher nutrient content as well as less additives. Same with the ice cream. It's going to be less inflammatory. It's not going to have rancid, pasteurized, and homogenized dairy fats. It's going to have a very high amount of fat soluble vitamins from having those high quality eggs and high quality dairy in them. And raw honey uh, digests a little better than sugar. I mean, it has this similar glucose to fructose ratio, but there's various beneficial enzymes in honey. Uh, so let's jump into you know specific food groups and trying to determine how and if we should be eating them. So meat and especially fish are very important because either of them are present in all tribes, both raw and cooked. Every group of indigenous people consumed at least 55%, averaging around 70% of their calories from animal foods. Uh, one important thing to note here is grain-fed versus grass-fed beef and animals in general, and farm versus wild fish in general, because grain and farmed current ways of animal agriculture did not exist just as if like these super large fruits and apples and higher yield vegetables did not exist. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, not only that, back then these animal foods had way more nutrition and we consumed all parts of them for certain reasons. You know, there's a reason the Maasai tribe talks about how they have a preference for fat of an animal as opposed to grain fed marbled ribeyes because they didn't exist. Raw meat is naturally palatable. Did you guys see The Revenant with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio where after he was injured he like crawls up to uh, a buffalo and starts eating it raw out of the corpse with a, another Native American? Uh, I just thought this was a, a funny anecdote for if you tasted all parts of a raw animal, they would each have specific palatability according to human taste. You know, humans need fat, humans need nutrients from organ meats, and especially DHA from brain, from marrow tissue, fat for energy, and then humans would have typically not eaten the lean muscle parts of the animal because there's no such thing as intramuscular marbling in wild animals. Definitely something interesting to note that raw meat, raw fish, or cooked meat and cooked fish are the only foods in nature that are palatable that we can consume to sustain ourselves from a nutrient and caloric standpoint. This is the one constant in all groups of people. Now, what determined the consumption of the rest of these foods was the access to fat. So maybe, you know, one group of people's only had access to lean fish, then they would have had to get the majority of their caloric energy consumption, which needs to be about 70-80% from fat from the fish as well as fruits, vegetables, and grains. So this is the reason we deviate from meat and fish, because there are groups of people that only eat meat and fish. Fruits only occur in specific regions of the world at certain times of the year, and not only that, you know, other animals would likely get to fruit before you did, and you know, humans can't climb super high into trees as bats could fly. There's many reasons why animals would get to fruits before we do. Uh, they offer little nutrition in the context of vitamins. They really only have some water-soluble vitamins B and C. They have little to no traces of fat-soluble vitamins, uh, with the exception of fatty fruit such as avocado, palm, I guess coconuts too. Uh, there are some fatty fruits that are local to specific parts of the world. Uh, the reason we crave the sweet flavor in fruits is because of uh, breast milk and because of access. We would never really have had access to large amounts of fruit. So if we get any, our body wants to eat them. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here is the modern versus the wild. Uh, you know, modern forms of fruit are much sweeter, much higher calorically yielding, whereas wild versions are almost sour and very rarely sweet. Uh, the most important thing to keep in mind here is regardless of how we look at fruit, in no context uh, should we be consuming it in more than a small percentage of our diet because of just how we would have had access to it in nature. Vegetables. Uh, cruciferous vegetables are really the only, at least a large part of the modern vegetables that people say to consume for your health, but they all originate from one plant and it's hard to justify modern like agricultural uh, changing and grafting of one plant making it to 10 different edible ways is the only source of nutrition sh we should have. So that's very contradictory. It's nothing close. Same with fruit. It's nothing close to the wild vegetables and various things we used to scavenge. Uh, natural cooking is something to keep in mind with if you cook the vegetable, is it edible? And by that I mean if you take that vegetable and you throw it over a fire, can you consume it and get calories from it? In most cases for vegetables, 
The answer is no, unless we're including starchy root vegetables. Because if you took a piece of kale, you know, you, you need various things to make that taste good. Uh, or give you some sort of nutrients or uh, caloric intake. You know, you're not going to absorb the vitamins in vegetables without fat. And if you don't have fat, you know, I mean, then you're getting calories, but without it, you're not. Uh, the starchy vegetables are present in various indigenous groups and they were consumed for calories. A good example is maybe Polynesians would have roasted a breadfruit over a fire and then they would have eaten it with some coconut milk that they made. Insignificant calories, we touched on that. The low vitamin bioavailability is what it has in common with fruits. It just doesn't have any fat soluble vitamins in their bioavailable animal form. And if it does have them in their plant form, we can't absorb them without fat. And even then the conversion rates are less than 10% and even closer to 3% for everything. Uh, we didn't, you know, plantains, bananas are another example of fruits that are much larger and higher yielding than they are now. Although there are some high yielding starchy vegetables in nature, it's for the energy calories, not for the nutrition. Grain consumption in the Neolithic Revolution correlates with a decrease in brain size and stature between certain groups of peoples that consume more grains. But on the other hand, they are a double-edged sword in the sense that they allowed us to settle down, develop culture, and have a lot more free time. And this is the same thing that we would consume vegetables and fruits for, for energy. The 80% of energy we needed that we could not get from fat, we consumed through grains. But there's a big difference between uh, even a white pasta or a fine flour pasta versus a pasta made with durum wheat or semolina. There's a big difference between modern hard red winter wheat which has 42 chromosomes and einkorn wheat which has tw uh, what is it? Uh, 14 chromosomes. So as the chromosomes go up, the wheat becomes harder to digest, it becomes hybridized, it becomes unnatural. So einkorn being the original form of wheat would be a much healthier version of wheat to consume than what we're eating now. Same thing with oats. There's various different forms of oats and rice, maize, sourdough breads. All of these foods have indigenous preparation methods to them. You know, in the case of all of these, they're very labor intensive. Uh, humans used to spend a large portion of their time procuring food and nutrition calories. And what this did was it reduced the amount of time we needed to spend procuring calories. So although we still spent six, eight, ten hours a day procuring calories, it was not an all day thing. And even in a lot of these cases, um, I believe a big reason that we started consuming grains was because a lot of the larger animals died off and we no longer had access to large ruminant flesh like mammoths. So this is, that's another thing that can tie in here, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, these are very time consuming to make and not only that, these are expensive to buy in their natural high quality state now. The reason we used to consume them was out of necessity, but if you go to buy iron corn wheat, freshly milled, you know, not only are all these things very expensive, they're very time consuming to make. Uh, you know, I used to mill my own flour and make my own sourdough bread. I've tried it a couple of times. It is not something that most people will be able to do. And that's kind of my answer for should we be eating rice? Should we be eating grains? Should we be eating vegetables and fruits? The wild versions and the versions we should be consuming are so expensive and so hard to access that in most cases, it's just impractical to not consume meat in the case of them. That's why. I personally don't consume those foods. That's why I consume meat instead because I can get grass-fed trim fat, grass-fed lamb fat for several dollars per pound and there's no real prep to it. It just doesn't make any sense. Dairy is interesting because dairy might be considered something unnatural, but many indigenous groups without access to seafood use dairy as a source of iodine as well as those mountain groups of people used it as a large source of calories they didn't have access to a lot of animals to hunt and things like that. It is super nutritious and palatable. I'm going to do a video on dairy within a couple days. Dairy is nutritionally complete. It literally has every vitamin and mineral. You could only eat dairy as evident by like the Swiss in the Los Angeles Valley got all of their calories from cheese and rye bread and other dairy products. Uh, it, although it is bordering unnatural, uh, we have had specific adaptations to consume it. Unfortunately, people like me are allergic. And there is differences between like goat milk, cow's milk, and sheep milk. And again, there's a huge difference between raw grass-fed milk and modern conventional dairy that's being sold in supermarkets now. Those are two completely different foods, as all of these are two completely different foods. Now we can briefly touch on sour and bitter things. 
like herbs, teas, cocoa, coca. Uh, depending on the various degrees of these, you know, obviously you don't want to consume a chocolate bar that has milk and sugar and soy in it versus raw, naturally sourced fermented cacao. Uh, seasonings are interesting because seasonings can create an artificial palatability, especially for vegan foods, but vegan foods tend to be a combination of seasonings and laboratory foods. So, you know, I mean, seasoning soy, honey, spices, maple, salt, sauces. You can gauge what are natural and what are not natural. Obviously, soy and maple syrup might be more on the unnatural side, whereas even honey might be, whereas salt, spices, and certain sauces and seasonings, you could kind of justify them either way. But the point is, you're creating an unnatural food palatability, and you have to analyze if that original food should be consumed. Uh, broccoli is a good example, because if you take a piece of broccoli and you steam it, there's no nutrient from it, whether it's macronutrient or micronutrient. If you take that piece of broccoli, you'll saute it in butter and olive oil, deglaze it with a little white wine, add some salt, make it really, really tasty, and have a little bit of fat calories. That's why it's misleading to say that, you know, these vegan diets, and they do a lot of things to make foods that are normally inedible to edible. You know, we're kind of tricking our taste buds. Uh, before we go into laboratory foods, I did forget to put nuts and seeds and stuff on here. Seeds would never have really been consumed from a natural perspective, and nuts would have only been consumed in very small amounts at very short periods of the year. So that kind of ties in with fruits, uh, you know, especially with the modern access to nuts and seeds we have now, it is way unrealistic. And uh, I mean, consider how they're grown, most of them are processed, some of them are radiated. There's many negative things that happen with nuts. Uh, I mean, especially things like legumes. Uh, I guess legumes tie into grains where there are certain versions of them that might be deemed okay and natural, but most of them are not. Uh, and there are indigenous preparation methods to them, which most people don't do, to reduce the anti-nutrient content, make them more digestible, things like that. Laboratory foods. Soy, vegetable oils, fast food, junk food, chemical flavors, food dyes. Uh, and then most vegan foods fall into this, especially if they're processed, but vegan foods are usually a combination of laboratory foods, seasonings, and then grains, vegetables, and fruits. Uh, it's definitely interesting to see how, you know, original nutrient content of foods vegans consume, you know, with seasonings, you know, it's very apparent that there's no nutrient content in these foods and how impractical and unrealistic it is to access them in nature and the amount of time you'd actually have to spend to, you know, you would never be able to harvest them, you'd never be able to prepare them, you just wouldn't have access without modern food shipping and, uh, and all those things. But, but laboratory foods are foods that most people will recognize that you shouldn't, shouldn't be consuming. Like people that think soy and vegetable oils are healthy for you just haven't looked at how they're made or the inf information behind them. Same thing with chemical food dyes, junk food, and fast food. No one's going to really agree that these foods would be good for you in any way. The problem with these foods is that some people think some of these are healthy, some people think some of them are not. There's a lot of variance in those. But, you know, just by altering these, we're altering the base palatability so much that you can't justify consuming it in any way. Whether it tastes good or bad, it shouldn't be consumed. Order of satiety. So as you can see, you're an unhappy fat guy, then you become happy, or you're an unhappy fat girl, and then you become happy. So the order of satiety is the human's natural hunger signal in relation to food palatability. Uh, you have a hunger signal for fat, you have a hunger signal for nutrients, you have a, a capacity signal for protein, and then there's no real signal for dessert or sweet foods. Uh, this ties into fasting where you can reset your palatability with fasting, whereas if you water fast for two or three days, you know, all of these are reduced. You know, your, your satiety, your hunger, your stomach, your digestion pretty much resets. Although it will work its way back up if you stuff yourself like a pig. When you eat fat, imagine taking a stick of butter and seeing how much fat you can eat. You're not going to get too far in, at least I hope. Uh, but there's going to be a very specific hunger signal that you feel when you eat only fat to satiation, you're gonna feel like, oh, I'm sick, I can't eat another bite. But you will not be physically full because it will only take a quarter to a half a pound of fat. And it might only take a few bites for some people. Then you'll have cravings for nutrients, organs, minerals, especially initially on a diet. And this could be electrolyte related too. Your body will eat, only be craving fat or nutrients. Your body will never really need protein in most cases because the protein would be obtained from the organs. So, Ideally, you eat fat to satiation, you're like, I can't eat anymore, and then maybe you're hungry for some organs, maybe you have a little craving for liver, and then after you eat that liver, you're not going to be hungry anymore, but you could still 
put more in your stomach. There's a big difference between being hungry, being satiated, and being full. That's what people don't seem to understand. You should never really eat to the point you're physically full. You don't have to do that. You should just eat to the point you're not hungry to not stretch your digestive system, to not consume excess calories your body doesn't want. Unfortunately, most people eat just protein and on this diet, the zero carb carnivore diet, to capacity, which means they're not getting the fat they need and they're not getting the nutrients they need. And although you guys might argue that you can convert protein to energy through gluconeogenesis, it's a much larger stress on the digestive system. It's the difference between eating five pounds of steak versus a, a half a pound of fat and a pound of organs. Uh, there's much less digestive stress and nutrient density. And just reducing the volume of the food you're eating might make you feel so much better. And there's a huge contradiction where people say on this zero carb carnivore diet, you need to eat more initially to get your nutrients in, but protein is not where the nutrients are. The nutrients are in the fat and the organs and all of those things. But after you satiate yourself on those foods, if you have a higher lean body mass or you are far into the carnivore diet, you might actually want some protein and that's where you would just eat protein to where you're still comfortable and you don't want to eat anymore. And that protein could be anything from fish to steaks, whatever, whatever you want. Uh, and then the problem with dessert is, you know, they always say there's always room for dessert. Sweet and carbs do not have a hunger signal. Uh, one interesting thing I used to do was I put a little bit of honey on some beef fat. What I essentially had was a large amount of calories that tasted like honey. So although I was only getting a few grams of sugar, I was getting five to 600 calories of fat. And that was a really easy and palatable way to see how my fat satiation was. Now, if the energy allotment is procured already from fat, you wouldn't really have a craving for non-sweet starchy vegetables. But once you add a sugar content to them and they become sweet, it is likely that you would be able to still consume them after your meal. That's why it helps to really make sure you're satiated on fat and nutrients and you won't be hungry anymore so you won't have the desire to eat those sweet foods. So one question you always have to ask yourself, are you hungry or are you thirsty? And this can tie into electrolytes, cravings, fullness versus satiation. Electrolytes are a big one and it's a big reason that one of the things I talk about with people when I'm helping them is water consumption. And the type of water you're consuming needs to have a decent amount of minerals as well as be void of any negative components. Uh, fullness versus satiation, as we spoke about, there's a difference between stuffing yourself like a pig and being not hungry. And then in regards to cravings, if you're eating inhuman amounts of food and you just can't satiate your hunger, you either need fat or nutrients. And then at the end of the day, fasting can reset palatability, so can reducing taste. So, you know, consuming raw meat, not adding salt to your steak, all of these things can alter food palatability in a way that it doesn't taste as good. What I'm basically saying is, the worse your food tastes, the less of it you're probably going to eat. So that's another way you can kind of reset your food palatability. And, uh, you know, food palatability ties into a lot of things. I'm sure there's many other things I could have talked about in this video, but it can really tell us if we should be consuming a food by looking at if the food is natural or not, and if the preparation is deemed natural, if it was done in indigenous groups of people. Pretty much what you're asking yourself is, if you can make the food in the woods, with like fire and water and, and no modern amenities, could you do it? Could you procure the food in the wild and cook it in the wild? In the case of things like honey, spices, soy, and things that vegans put on their foods, absolutely not. Same with laboratory foods. And this kind of also throws out grain, farmed meat and things, but then the problem with this is a lot of these foods need to be individually assessed because we could argue that eating grain-fed beef is not good for you from an antibiotic standpoint, from a poor macronutrient ratio standpoint, but eating grain-fed beef might be better for you than eating einkorn wheat. That is a relative question that, that, that needs to be answered. So, uh, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other those, but I've kind of covered all the points I believe I've needed to do. Uh, one interesting thing is uh, we didn't really touch on the fermented foods that much, but salmon roe, when fermented, has all of these flavors. It has a sweet hint from the nuttiness of the just the high quality eggs. It has saltiness from the sea. It has a sour, bitter, and acidic taste from the fermentation. It has umami from the fermentation, and it is very rich in fat and cholesterol. There are foods in nature that check all of these boxes, uh, without a doubt, and there's foods in nature that only check some, but generally speaking, foods like fermented liver, fermented salmon roe, or just maybe fatty fish liver in general, tend to check 
so many of these boxes in a natural way that it's easy to say that they're foods we should have been consuming in nature. M many, many ways to kind of gauge what foods you should be eating and shouldn't be eating, but uh, you know, if this doesn't really tell you what you should be eating, I don't know what will. So thank you guys for watching. If you guys would like to support me, uh, just share the video, maybe even just leave a comment below let me know how you liked it. Uh, I did put some uh, Amazon affiliate links in my description lately. Just the products that I use, like seaweed, salt, eye mask, uh, things like that. Uh, in addition to that, you guys can check out my Patreon and see the various tiers of support. And if you'd like to reach out to me for a one-on-one -on -one consultation in regards to diet, fitness, water, sun exposure, uh, just being optimally healthy, you can shoot me an email, frankatufano at gmail.com. It's in the description. But as always, uh, thank you guys for watching and let me know if you would like to see any videos in particular over the next two or three weeks.